Hi everybody. I just wanted to say that this is going to be the last time that I put my face here in this little corner uh, because I've been doing it without it for uh, my other class and my load times are so much faster. Um, so just to make everything easier right here at the end, um, I'm going to stop recording my face, uh, but we can have Zoom sessions and you can see me and I can see you. Um, so here we go into the gymnosperms. Whenever we consider the evolution of a new group of plants, it's important to consider the world that they're evolving within. Our bryophytes were the first plants to move onto land, most likely, and they would have had this completely open terrestrial surface, which would have been high exposure for them, which is tricky, right? That is stress that they are going to have to adapt to, but they don't have to compete with any other plants. The seed revascular plants have to compete with the existing bryophytes for space and for sunlight, However, those existing bryophytes would have already formed some sort of soil base, at least an organic uh, layer that's going to be water holding. And then they transport that water up to these higher aerial tissues with their lignified vascular tissue. And then they can grow 100 feet tall and we get forests of seed-free vascular plants. So when the gymnosperms evolved, there were a lot of large changes happening within the global environment. So for seed-free vascular plants in that Carboniferous period, um, and even in the Devonian, we would have had these um, kind of inland seas that were pretty shallow and pretty swampy. Um, most of the continental mass, I think, was in the uh, equatorial range, so it was more tropical overall. But then we have these new groups of plants that are evolving, right? When you have the seed free vascular plants, we're getting this accumulation of woody tissue. We have now true roots that are penetrating down into the soils. So um, a lot of stuff is happening. And another thing that's happening is that insects are co-evolving with these group of plants, um, groups of plants. So insects evolved over 400 million years ago, around the same time as we start to see terrestrial plants, we start to see terrestrial insects. They evolved from crustaceans that were aquatic. So they are co-evolving with these different groups of plants. And the first winged insects roughly coincide with our first gymnosperms. So if we think about large events that were affecting the climate and affecting the overall uh, kind of physical structure of the earth. Around the time of terrestrial plants, first evolving, we had global cooling and that first soil building. At first it would have been chemical where we have um, metabolic acids being produced by these organisms um, that are interacting with the rocky surface, right? Um, and then we get physical weathering once we start to develop roots. Those roots that develop, which happens when we get lignified vascular tissue, are going to be changing the way that water flows around the planet. So they're gonna stabilize riverbanks and alter the course and structure of waterways. And that's gonna allow waterways to kind of carve deeper as opposed to kind of being more expansive and spreading out across the surface. So that means there's going to be high water, avail water availability in some areas and lower water, avail water availability in others. Ooh. So then we also start to see woody debris from all of these seed-free vascular plants that have tons of this lignified vascular tissue that potentially organisms don't know how to break down yet. They haven't maybe evolved the ability to um, deal with lignin. So that woody debris is clogging waterways, it's altering the course of rivers, and we're also starting to see soil enrichment. So this building of um, soils from the bottom with the rocky uh, parent material and from the top with these deposits of organic matter. And this is the world in which the gymnosperms evolve. So that word gymnosperm means naked seed. So we have one big evolutionary leap. We get seeds. These are the first seed plants. But those seeds aren't contained within any kind of vessel for at least most of the groups. So we have seeds and we can send our offspring out with a bunch of extra nutrition so that hopefully they'll have a better chance of survival. So in these few videos, we're going to look at some additions to the big phylogeny. And what that will be are these characteristics of gymnosperms. So what new traits do we see that are uniting um, these newly evolved seed plants? Under those characteristics of gymnosperms, we'll look at xerophytic leaves, we'll draw a cross section of a pine needle and review those characteristics that we learned in the leaf lab that allow these leaves to um, be highly adapted to dry conditions. Remember zero means dry. Then we'll look at gymnosperm diversity. We have four major groups of gymnosperms. Um, the nidophytes aren't really the nidophyta anymore. Um, they belong within the conifers, most likely. 
So some characteristics of gymnosperms. Gymnosperms have secondary growth. So this means they have true woody tissues, right? And instead of just having woody tissues um, that allow you to make these water pipes and grow tall, now they allow for, so we have wood, oh, wad. <laughs> we have wood, and that allows for this um, increase in the girth of the trunk, right? So instead of just growing up, which primary growth allows you to do, now our trunks can get wider. So that provides more structural support for getting even taller. In addition to secondary growth, our woody tissues, we have um, pollen as dispersal. So up until this point, we had spores for dispersal for our bryophytes and for our seed-free vascular plants. They would um, have their propagules that they were releasing be those spores. So now we have pollen, and pollen is the male gametophyte. This is also called the microgametophyte. So now we have aerial dispersal of this microgametophyte. Because we are now sending our microgametophyte out into the world, we have made it smaller. So now we have a four-celled uh, microgametophyte. And what the oops. what this corresponds to is a loss of antheridia. So before we had these multicellular gametangia. Now we only have multicellular gametangium for um, the female gametophyte. So the archegonia still exists, but we have lost antheridia. Now we just have this four-celled microgametophyte. The next big evolution we have our seeds. So think of a seed as before we are mass producing um, spores, right? As we send those out to go um, grow into gametophytes. And then those gametophytes have to then produce our gametes, which then need to go fuse. So we didn't really send those out with um, much of a chance for survival. Instead, we relied on um, just high production. With seeds, you might be producing fewer propagules. But what you're going to do is you're going to put a bunch of nutrients and um, storage into that seed to then say, OK, I've made a zygote. I did it. I can reproduce now. Um, but I want this thing to be able to survive once it gets there. So these seeds are like sending your kids out with a sack lunch, right? giving it um, the, more of a chance to survive once it gets out into the world. So now we have this stored nutrients and protective coating for our zygotes. And then specific to gymnosperms, we're going to see xerophytic leaves. And this corresponds to the conditions that they're adapting to. The world is drying out. Water is being increasingly channeled um, into specific waterways instead of having these large inland seas. The continents are moving around, mountains are forming, um, and overall the land masses are drying out. So we have to have adaptations for dealing with that harsh environment, which would be the xerophytic leaves, as well as the bark that we're going to have with our secondary growth. All right, here's a review. Ooh, heterosporous. Um, this was something that I left off. So heterosporous, we have megaspores. 
um, and those megaspores are retained. So we saw heterosporous condition in Selaginella, um, and that was the first time we saw it, and then it disappeared. So it just sort of evolved within Selaginella, and then it convergently evolved within all of the um, gymnosperms and angiosperms. So all of our seed plants are going to have megaspores and microspores, and those megaspores are going to be retained. Let's put all these characteristics onto the big phylogeny. So we'll put our ferns and horsetails. Here we would have had megaphils, leaves with branching vascular tissue, and the Conifer lineage is, um, not the conifer lineage, the gymnosperm lineage is a little tricky. So it's monophyletic. They all derive from a single ancestor. But who comes out first and how these groups are related is still under investigation. So we are using information from the um, 1KB, um, so 1,000 um, plant transcriptomes, and they have the ginkgos as coming out first, then the cycads. And I'm drawing this somewhat incorrectly here. Um, we have the Penopsida, so these are the conifers. And within the Penopsida, we have the neophytes, most likely according to this particular research we're using. So this indicates that these two are separate groups. The way that I've drawn it, but this is within this. Um, so just know that, but it makes it too confusing looking if I try to <laughs> draw it a different way. Okay, so let's add our traits to our main line. We have seeds, we have pollen, we have secondary growth, wood, um, we have heterosporous. With the megaspore retained. And we have a loss of antheridia. So all of these traits continue on into our next group. Um, so you could even fill this in here. Anthophyta, those are our angiosperms. And that'll be our last group. So they're all on the main line. I'm going to put xerophytic leaves here. we don't know what the earliest angiosperms look like. They might have had xerophytic leaves. They might not. All of our gymnosperms that we look at do have xerophytic leaves, and so that's a trait that we can put to unite this group and everything after it. Um, but I'm not going to put it on the main line because that's not really going to be a trait that helps us distinguish our angiosperms. One thing um, that's also maybe kind of important is that wood has potentially likely evolved many different times and how secondary growth occurs. So it's possible that this doesn't really belong here, but um, for simplicity, we will keep it there. 